Good morning, class. This is the lecture for March 30th on the rise of Islamic political movements. And um, this is probably one of the most important lectures I would give in this semester because this is the one that bears directly on the ideology that has marked um, the Middle East from all of your, pretty much all of your lifetimes. Um, and that is the idea that there should be <coughs> a political Islam, a political Islamic state. Um, so and there are a lot of ideas in this lecture, so I will try to speak a little bit slower than usual, and I would expect you would have some questions on what I'm going to say. And so first, I wanna start off with just a, a brief explanation of what is what, what does it mean when we say Islamism? Now, Islam obviously is a religion, and it has a whole code of behavior <coughs> that Muslims follow. And that is then embodied in a law that they call Sharia. And uh, Muslims believe that if they are to live a good life and get to heaven, then they have to follow the rules laid out by their religious scholars, who in turn get those rules from the Quran and from the what is known as the Sunnah of the Prophet. That is the way the Prophet lived his life. So Muslims believe that it should be an all-encompassing body of law that governs all aspects of their life. And in this, they're not unlike uh, Jewish law, halakha, which also, which as I'm sorry, elaborated in the Talmud, presents for Jews uh, an equally elaborate set of rules on how everyday things are supposed to be done. So uh, how do we know that? And um, what do we do with it? That is, Historically, Muslim states have, have had rulers. Originally, we had, they had caliphs, and then after the caliphate ended, technically in 1258, uh, they had sultans. And the political ideology of the state, in Sunni states, that is, was that the ruler would be um, justified as long as he followed the Islamic law, that he did nothing that went against the law, and he did everything in his power to promote the law and to make sure that he had a, he was ruling a just society. Now, as we move into the modern period, we, we see the rise of nationalism, and that is that people begin to associate or think that they should set up a, a state based on their nationality or their ethnicity. And in the Middle East, we saw that these ideas uh, came in first with the uh, uh, Turkish nationalist ideology of the Young Turks, which said that Turk were people who spoke a language, Turkish, and that was more important than any of anything else in their identity. And in the Arab world, then we saw the slow rise of, of Arab identity. And in the Arab world, it's always complicated by the fact, uh, do we have a, a regional identity? Is that stronger than our overall arching Arab identity? And I think the easiest way way for you to think about that is think about Latin America, or Spanish-speaking Latin America. Now, everyone, all those countries in Latin America, except Brazil, uh, speak Spanish, and they therefore have a lot in common, but they don't tend to see themselves as one people. Um, and so the question is, do, should Arab states, which there are 21 of them, should the Arab states see themselves primarily as their states or primarily as Arabs? That, had, that was the big debate in the first half of the 20th century. And we, I mentioned the place where it was the strongest was in Egypt because the Egyptians had a very distinct identity of their own while speaking Arabic. Um, so what is different now with Islamism is that in the Islamic political movements, they are putting Islam back into uh, the idea of government. That is that, uh, whereas the nationalists were nodding to Islam, they were saying that Islam, especially remember the Ba'ath party said that Islam was proved the genius of the Arab people. So Islam was a part of the Arab people, but it wasn't, you know, it, it did, wasn't, they, they said this is, the Quran was genius because it was, it was Arab, not because it was from God. So the emphasis shifted from, from the religion to the uh, national identity or ethnic identity. And what the Islamists want to do is shift it back. They want to say that the basis of the state has to be Islam, that the um, nationality is largely irrelevant, uh, that if the state 
is run by Islamic law, uh, then there'll be justice for everyone and that um, they don't need uh, other kinds of safeguards. All right, so, that, so there are two, that's, we saw in the lecture on Egypt that Hassan al-Banna in Egypt in 1928, when he founds the Muslim Brotherhood, he is moving in that direction. In other words, he's moving in the direction of that it should be an Islamic-based state rather than an Arab or an Egyptian-based state. And the key point would be, what do you put first, Islam or your ethnicity or your state? And he would put, and Islam is put generally, that, well, not generally, always, put that Islam is the basis, so that a, a, a Muslim state must be governed by Islamic law. And um, that would, makes one an Islamist. Now, within the Islamist movement, there are various uh, range, a wide range of people. There are what we call the constitutional Islamists. That is, they are people who believe that the Islamic State should be brought about by the ballot box, that the Islam Islamists should organize themselves into political parties. And this is what the Muslim Brotherhood did in Egypt, uh, especially after they were, uh, Anwar Sadat legalized them, uh, uh, that they could then gain popular support, elect people to parliament, and then have a prime minister who is sympathetic to Islamic ideology, and that they would then have a, a more Muslim republic than they had been had. So in other words, they are not rejecting the Western idea of a democracy and uh, political parties uh, or constitutions. They're just saying that if there is a constitution, it can't do anything that goes against the Islamic law. Then there are the more radical uh, Islamists, and those are the ones I'm going to talk about more today because they give rise to these very extreme movements um, in uh, Islam that we have seen in Al-Qaeda and then ISIS or Daesh as it's known in the Arab world. And I'll talk more of those at the end of the lecture, but I have to go back a little bit in history and go back to the founding of the Muslim state, which was by the prophet Muhammad, uh, he died in 632. And the Muslims decided that there should, the state should continue, that prophecy was done, but there should be a Muslim state. And their, their push for that seems to have come largely from the Jewish tradition. So in the Jewish tradition, you have both David and Solomon who were kings, but also prophets. So Muhammad was seen both as a political leader of the Muslim state and also as a prophet of God. Uh, with his death, then there's no more prophecy, but the state should carry on. And so they instituted uh, what we call a caliphate, that is someone who succeeds as a prophet, not as a, um, a, a religious leader, but as a political leader. And that his duty then is to make sure that the, the Muslim community is protected and that it also it, it is governed by the principles that the prophet Muhammad laid out. Um, all right, so you have then bickering among Muslims over who should be that person. Uh, and then finally, in um, six, uh, six, 656, uh, there is a civil war in the Islamic world between people, between factions. And one faction was led by uh, the prophet's um, cousin, a man named Ali who also then married one of the prophet's daughters. And Ali and his daughter, Fatima, so I'm sorry, Ali and his wife, the daughter of the prophet Muhammad, her name was Fatima. Ali and Fatima had two sons and they were the only uh, grandchildren that the prophet had. And so by Arab tradition, the, if there is no sons, then the leadership of the clan can go through a daughter. Um, and so Fatima, the, the children of Fatima then would, were considered to be the legitimate heirs uh, to the prophet Muhammad. So Ali then is, 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 is revered in, in Islam. He was one of the first, he was the first male convert to Islam according to tradition. He was a you know, warrior for the, the cause. Uh, and he then tries to compromise um, between the other faction. And a group of his followers said that the compromise is impossible you have, there's only one truth, there's only one righteous way. And if you don't follow that righteous way, then you have become no better than an unbeliever. And one of their 
that group assassinated Ali. And now the only reason I'm telling you this story, which is it's an interesting story, but the, it has relevance because the group that went out, that, that uh, rejected Ali, I mean, who said that Ali was being too soft by willing to compromise, and then one of them would later assassinate Ali, they were called by the other Muslims, Kharijis, or those who go out, those who exceed the boundaries of, of boundaries of, of um, proper behavior. And they had said, part of their, their, their propaganda was that they said that if a Muslim ruler uh, is unjust and breaks the law, doesn't follow everything that the Muslims say uh, of what Islam says he should do, then it is the duty of, of a Muslim to kill that leader. And so we have then the justified homicide, or in their view, the justified homicide of, of what in the rest of the Arab world is considered a saintly man. I'm sorry, the Muslim world even. And, and especially among the Shia, Ali then becomes the, the figure who should have been the rightful ruler right immediately following Muhammad. So I just wanted to tell you that because it is, is a, um, an extremist tradition within Islam. Uh, it is largely forgotten or remembered as a, a warning. You shouldn't, you shouldn't go against the established rule of law, uh, that you shouldn't think that you have the right to, to kill another Muslim. And in fact, the Quran tells us you cannot kill another Muslim. Um, so that it was an extreme ideology that was lurking on the edge of uh, Islamic intellectual traditions. And generally, it's, as I said, it's remembered as a negative counterexample. It's something that you should be avoided at all costs. All right, so we, that was in, he was, Ali was assassinated in 661. So we jump forward in time uh, to the 14th century, the 1300s. Uh, the Muslim world had gone through a number of shocks, uh, starting in 1095, oh, actually 1098. 1095, the Crusades start in Europe. They don't reach Jerusalem until 1098. So the sack of Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem, or the population in it by the Crusaders, the occupation then of uh, what is most of what is today Israel and the West Bank and Lebanon um, by the Crusader states, uh, they are eventually expelled. And not long after they're expelled, the Mongols show up and the Mongols destroy Baghdad and large areas of the Muslim world. So the Muslim state, Muslims have gone through two really important shocks, both of which are, um, uh, rest, uh, are inflicted on them by infidels. On one hand, Christians, on the other hand, pagan Mongols. So that period creates a, a very strong idea of, of jihad, of protecting Islam against these enemies that have come in, the Crusaders and the Mongols, and keep those names in, in, in your mind because in the 20th century, those people are invoked again by the radical Muslims to show why Islam has to be, uh, take what looks like an offensive war. It really is a defensive war is how they're explaining it. And I'll come, you know, just keep those names. So in that time of crisis, you have a scholar named Ibn Taymiyyah, that's his last name, we have you know, a whole string of first names. Uh, so he's just known as Ibn Taymiyyah, it's on your sheet. He was a Muslim scholar living in uh, Damascus. And he wrote a number of, of scholarly works, most of which are fairly extreme um, by what had been the standard. For example, he wrote a, a tract against the Christians that was much stronger than anything any Muslim writer had written before because the Christians were supposed to be tolerated as a minority. And as long as they didn't help outside forces and they, didn't, they paid their taxes, they were supposed to be left alone. Um, but uh, Ibn Taymiyyah actually attacks their faith and their beliefs and basically says that they are a bunch of infidels. Uh, he does also this for some of the Shia groups uh, so he's a very intolerant guy, and among his, his, what will come down to haunt Muslims is that he introduces this idea, or reintroduces this idea that the Kharijis had said. The Kharijis had said, remember that Ali had, by agreeing to compromise, had moved off the strict path of Islam and had not taken the, right, the, the path of the righteous, but was willing to compromise. And by being willing to compromise, he had forfeited his right to be considered a Muslim. And therefore his killing 
was justified. Now, this is articulated much more clearly by Ibn Taymiyyah, and he introduces the word takfir, and it's on your sheet, but just to make sure you get it, it's, ta I'm sorry, T-A-K-F-I-R. Uh, and it comes from the Arabic word kafir, K-A-F-I-R, which is the word that the Quran uses for unbelievers. Um, generally, it means pagans. It can mean Christians who believe in the Trinity, but generally it's, it's reserved for people who don't believe in the one God, so Jews, Christians, Muslims believe in the one God, and they're therefore not Kafirs. Um, but what he's saying, Ibn Taymiyyah, is takfir then, go back to that, is the Arabic way of saying the act of making one a Kafir, or to make call someone a Kafir. And so takfir then is the process by which a Muslim says another Muslim is not a true Muslim, but is a Kafir, an unbeliever. And the Quran is quite clear what it says about unbelievers. It says that you shall fight them until either you kill them or they convert to Islam, they accept Islam. So in his view, this is Ibn Taymiyyah, it is legitimate for Muslim Muslims to look at their rulers and say, this man is not acting according to Islamic law. I therefore have the moral right and in fact the moral obligation to uh, assassinate him, to kill him. So this is a terrible idea in Islam because of the civil wars that had marred the very beginning and as I mentioned the killing of Ali who in later traditions becomes one of the great heroes or saints of Islam even. Uh, he's killed by someone who has that kind of a extreme idea and so Ibn Taymiyyah himself is imprisoned uh, by his governor. The governor clearly didn't like this idea that somebody was spreading this possibility of killing. And he's imprisoned uh, in Damascus and he dies um, in prison. Now, whether he was killed or whether he just died in prison, it's not clear, but he, he dies. And his views then are put on the side. I mean, people, religious scholars uh, know him, know his works, but uh, no one else invokes that. Um, there, uh, until you get to a very um, uh, charismatic preacher, a guy named uh, Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab. And I've already mentioned him in class, but again, his last name, it's on your sheet, is Ibn Abdul Wahab. So you have to have the Ibn, because that means son of. Remember, that's like Mac or O in Irish names. So you have our fun in German names or day in, in Italian, Spanish, French names. You have to have that in the name. You, so you can't call him Abdul Wahab. You have to call him Ibn Abdul Wahab. Uh, he was a preacher in the Arabian desert, and he gathered, he was very charismatic, as I said, he was also very rigid. And he, as a scholar, had uh, rediscovered, or at least re-thought uh, a lot about Ibn Taymiyyah, and he, he accepted what Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, his plan, his, his view of Islam. And he then, um, this is Ibn Abdul Wahab, was able to unite with a tribal leader named Muhammad Ibn Saud. And that's the same name as that's the family that's the current head of Saudi Arabia. So that's I-B-N again. And then you want to put a hyphen in there to make sure you know that the Ibn goes with the Saud, S-A, then apostrophe U-D. So Saud in Arabic. And we don't have that sound in English. So we just kind of use the represented by an apostrophe. So you know that it should be pronounced as two separate syllables, Sa'ud. If your, your throat can constrict, it's Sa'ud. Um, but if it can't, it's Sa'ud. So Ibn Sa'ud um, uh, is the tribal leader and he makes an alliance with this charismatic preacher. And in fact, they, they tend to intermarry and down to today, the Ibn Sa'ud family is the ruling family. And the Ibn Abdul Wahhab is a little bit too hard even for Arabs to say. And so his family is this known as the, the Ibn al-Sheikh. Sheikh means the teacher or leader or religious scholar. It has lots of meanings, but in this case it meant religious scholar. So that family is known as the Ibn al-Sheikh family. Uh, and they're still there and they're still, most of the religious authorities are, are from that, in Saudi Arabia are from that family. So the families have kept that connection. Now back to them. They, uh, he, uh, Ibn Abdul Wahab preaches that one, that the, there is no such thing as the caliphate. The caliphate is long gone. It died with Ali. And that so all we have left is uh, the Sharia. And that Islamic law has to be the only 
governance that you, you, the Ottoman state, which was the largest Muslim state at the time, was a corrupt state. It wasn't following Sharia completely, and so therefore it was an illegitimate state. Furthermore, he, he declared that the Shia, who were uh, in neighboring Iran, but also in Iraq, were heretics and were, were true Kafirs um, because of their, their view toward Ali. Uh, not so much, I mean, the Sunnis liked Ali, but the, they, uh, Ibn Abdul Wahab is saying that the, um, the Shia deified Ali, which is not true for the Imami Shia. It is true for some of the other Shia groups, but not for the main group. But he is clearly, Ali is clearly a main thing. And also the fact that they believe then in this Imam who has the power when he comes back to, to rearrange things. So the belief in the Imam uh, for Ibn Abdul Wahab was a proof of their being Kafirs. Sorry about this, it like keeps going off because it doesn't think I'm doing anything because I'm talking. Uh, so, um, the, the, his, when he died, 1795, Ibn Abdul uh, whoever the head of the Saud family was, I think at that time it was Saud Ibn Saud, uh, he raids north into Iraq and massacres the, uh, the largely the uh, Shia population, the holy city in, uh, in uh, Karbala. Uh, and that is since shockwaves across the Muslim world um, because Muslims don't kill Muslims. At this point, the Shia Sunni thing, it's, it's understood that it exists, but Sunni scholars weren't willing to say that Shia scholars, Shia were not Muslims. They, they, they were Muslims. They were maybe Muslims a little bit wrong, but they were Muslim. And so the massacre of the, the women and children, um, old people, um, by Ibn Saud in Karbala was considered uh, really terrible. And uh, uh, it said, like I said, shockwaves. What more shockwaves is that the family then went and part of the group, in South group, went and, and occupied Mecca and Medina. So they occupied the two holy cities of Arabia, and this is in 1803. Uh, and in Medina, they even tear down the mosque of the Prophet Muhammad. There was a mosque built there to for Muhammad's tomb, and the Wahhabis, as we call them, the Wahhabis believe that you shouldn't mark anybody's tomb. There should be no gravestones. There should be no tombs whatsoever. So they tore down the mosque of the prophet. So that for Sunnis was like, wow, this is really terrible. These guys are really crazy. Uh, and eventually the, the uh, Ottoman state was able to suppress them and they went into hiding uh, in the desert where they stayed. And they then will emerge in the 20th century. But why I brought them in is because they they will show up at the end of this lecture as well. The Wahhabis, the role the Wahhabis have done in spreading political Islam, but they they are a key link in the um, the chain from the Harajis to Ibn Taymiyyah to the Wahhabis, and then down to we're going to see in just a minute. I'm going to talk in just a minute about to save Qutb, who is the the link on into present to Al-Qaeda and to Daesh. Uh, so let's go back in, to the early 20th century. So as I said, you had um, the Muslim Brotherhood who, who are uh, political Islam. So they are technically Islamist, but they are not extremists. They don't believe in, in killing people. They believe, like I said, power through the ballot box. Uh, Non-Islamists often worry that if the Islamists take power through the ballot box once they take power once they're in power they, they will abolish the ballot box but uh, that did not happen in Egypt um, in 2012 when uh, Mohammed Morsi came to power it did not happen in Tunisia when an Islamist party uh, Anahda, uh had the majority in the parliament so I you know that that is some a scare tactic that I think non-Islamists sometimes use, but though we can't be sure. But the point is, these Muslim brothers uh, in the 30s and the 40s, up until uh, Hassan al-Banna is assassinated in, in 1949. Uh, and at that time, one of his uh, lieutenants, a guy named Said Qutb, who's on your list, um, takes over. And now he's a very, uh, he's, he's not a guy you would think would would naturally become a radical. I mean, he is educated in the secular Egyptian National Teachers University. Uh, so he's not going to the Islamic schools. I mean, he is a devout Muslim and you know, he studies studies uh, with Muslim teachers, uh, but he's not a traditional Muslim scholar. Uh, he's more of a, a secular uh, 
kind of scholar. And it, he's, his turning point, though, is he gets a scholarship to go to America, and he goes to America in 1947, 48, I think it is, or 46, 47. Anyway, it's a two-year period. He's in school in Colorado, and he's a dark-skinned Egyptian. So like Anwar Sadat, he has uh, Nubian or African blood uh, in his ancestry, so he stands out. He took a bus, I guess, and arrived in New York or wherever it was, and he had to take a bus across America, and he ended up going through the South, and so he faced discrimination as an uh, uh, African-American. Uh, and so he was just shocked that America, the country that he had been told was this democracy, I remember from last lecture, it kind of seemed to most people in the Middle East as the kind of ideal Western state. He sees this as a very racist place. He then gets to Colorado, and this is Colorado from the 40s, and he thinks it's a decadent place. The, the colleges, the women and men are dancing together on the dance floor, or they're drinking beer, and this is, boy, this is really, a, a, you know, a Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and he goes back to Egypt, and he writes a book about it, My, my Experience in America, which is really very, you know, it, I don't know if it's been translated in English, but it really is an eye-opener to any American time you think that America is the best place on earth to live, then you should read this book. Um, and, but then he writes another book that's called um, uh, Social Justice uh, in Islam. And this is a, a beginning of his radicalization. And I want to talk through some of what he is saying, um, and because it's important. It's a fairly large book. It's been translated into English. Uh, and what he's basically laying out is something that goes back to the Salafi movement, and I, I realized I kind of skipped over, I didn't get into one of the questions, why did the Salafis become radical? And I guess this is a good point to introduce it. So remember back to the Salafis, they, that was Muhammad Abdu and his students in Egypt. They believed that if you went back to the simple Islam, uh, of the Islam of the ancestors, the people who lived around the time of the prophet, you're going to find a moral guide to today and that that moral guide uh, doesn't, isn't contradict a lot of what we've, what we've been learning about the West. It doesn't contradict uh, democracy, doesn't contradict political parties, doesn't contradict all those things, constitutions, all those things are in fact, Islam um, already set them out before the Westerners ever discovered them. And so one of the general tenets of then the Salafi movement was that Islam uh, was almost a perfect religion in that it allowed for both the spiritual and the mundane. Uh, it gave us the spiritual, it taught us about God and the afterlife, but it also told us how to live a moral code on earth. And so society could be built around Islamic principles. And what Abdu said was that these principles aren't in, in, in uh, contradiction to what the Westerners are saying. Um, and in fact, he they argue, and then this will be brought up by uh, Kutub, that's one of the reasons I'm digressing. They argue that, that Islam uh, had been a scientific society. Muslims, Muslims in the Middle Ages, what, what were the Middle Ages in Europe, were uh, inventing all kinds of new discoveries, um, optics, uh, eyeglasses, the first eyeglasses are, are written about by a Muslim scholar, um, algebra, uh, all kinds of advanced mathematics, our, our astronomy is greatly advanced. So what he's saying is that Muslims weren't, uh, despite what the West came to the Middle East and they said, oh, these people are backward. These people are really backward. They're backward scientifically, they're backward medically, they're backward every way, politically. And then in part, they gave the justification why the West should occupy the Middle East. Um, and uh, what Abdu and his, men are, his followers are saying is that, no, we were, we were a very advanced culture. And uh, what went wrong then? What went wrong is we strayed from Islam. We, we started to have political rulers who were corrupt and who uh, were selfish and who uh, lived in their private lives were very venial and, and corrupt. And so our whole system got corrupted um, from the top down and that um, uh, we quit being, we Muslims, quit being the producers of science uh, and we became, fell behind the rest of the world. So why did the Christians advance? They put forward the idea that Christianity is only a spiritual religion, not a material religion. And so as long as the Christians were really Christian, i.e. the Middle Ages, they didn't advance at all because they didn't believe in science. 
they thought science was you know the devil's plaything or whatever and so they didn't make any progress at all until the renaissance and he then says the renaissance is a turning away from religion that's really interesting well, clearly it's an outsider's view of it because clearly europeans wouldn't say that they, you look at all the religious paintings that are painted in the renaissance Renaissance period, you say, well, there's got to be some religion there somewhere. But he said, but they're putting forward this idea that the the Middle East, or Islam, has always been spiritual and scientific. The West was spiritual but not scientific. They had to give up their spirituality in order to become scientific. That's the you know, argument in a nutshell. And then that is is uh, uh, that we then progress. Well, then his generation of students, and you have on your list uh, two of them. Um, Rashid Rida and Shakib Aslan. Uh, they're both Lebanese, Lebanese Sunni Muslims. Uh, they both studied in Cairo. Um, and they both then returned to Syria after the war and are faced with the French occupation. And so increasingly, especially more um, Rashid Rida than in Shakib Aslan, Shakib Aslan becomes more and more nationalistic, um, but still has a very strong Islamic element to Arab nationalism. Uh, Rashid Rida uh, pretty much voices the idea that Islam is under threat from the West and that that our main duty is to defend ourselves as Muslims against this onslaught of these, these, uh, these Christians. And so the Salafi movement then becomes much more politicized than it had been before. It, 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 rather than seeing the West as um, something to be emulated, uh, it is something that has to be questioned very, very strictly and uh, not to assume that everything the West says about democracy and uh, constitutions and human rights are true because look at what they're doing here in the Middle East. They're occupying us and they're, you know, they're controlling us and where's our freedom? You know, where's our human rights? So it, there was a real uh, turn there in the 30s and the 40s. Um, brought about by uh, British and French uh, presence in the Middle East, and then increasingly the situation in Palestine becomes enigmatic for Muslims, uh, saying that this is a proof that the Westerners want to kick us out. And again, think the Crusades. During the Crusades, the Crusades had occupied the same territories. It occupied pretty much what is uh, Israel and the West Bank and uh, Lebanon. And uh, they start to uh, they start to be these, these kind of sayings like, "Well, we waited a hundred years to drive the Crusaders out of uh, our lands, and uh, you know we will wait a hundred years to drive the Zionists out of our lands again." Uh, so that becomes it becomes much more religiously tinged. Um, uh, one of my former students. Uh, who just recently has a book out called "The Age of Coexistence." His name is Usama. Uh, his, he argues in the book that it's the whole Zionist um, settlement in Palestine that, that pushes Muslims to think of themselves as Muslims uh, rather than being Arabs or some other kind of ethnic identification. He argues, I'm, you know, I'm not 100% not sure that it's the only reason, but he argues that because the Zionists are identifying a political identity with a religious identity, that is Jews, Jews are a religion, Jews are a people, uh, that Muslims then began to rethink their own identity. And uh, you do see it in people like Rashid Rida and Shakib Arslan. So you do see that the Islamic, and then back to the Muslim Brothers, I mentioned the Muslim Brothers that sent volunteers to fight in the 1936 uh, uprising in Palestine. So the, the, the kind of a politicization of Islam as a identity, as a defense against the West. All right, so that, that's the radical, the shifting, not radical, but that's the progression uh, that we see with the Salafi movement. Now go back to Sayyid Qutb. So Sayyid Qutb then takes a lot of these same ideas and he says that uh, the West is um, scientific and modern, blah, 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 uh, but the, the institutions are, are not. They're, they're, they, they put on this front, but I've seen myself in the United States that there really is no democracy. There is no human rights. Look at the way they treat African-Americans. Uh, and so they're no model for us. So what is our model? Our model is go back to where we were. I mean, when we were Muslims, we were great. And so we need to do that again. Uh, so this, it, it, the book is 
you know, he, he is a lot about Islam as the third way, that it's uh, not communism, it's not capitalism. It's the, it's the good things of capitalism and the good things of communism without the atheism of, uh, of communism and with more moral uh, regulation than cap Western capitalism has. And um, the other thing he says in this book, which, which is interesting, is that uh, then what do we need from the West? We need only science. That uh, history, uh, politics, philosophy, any kind of humanities is tainted, tainted, I should say, tainted by uh, Western imperialism and that we don't need it. And the only thing that we need from the West is objective truth and that's science. And I think it's interesting that when you look at the people who took part in the uh, September 11th uh, hijacking of the planes and then the crashing into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, they all had, had scientific degrees, either engineering or scientific degrees. So he's, he's saying that Muslims can learn from the West. We can learn medicine, we can learn technology, we can learn, but don't learn any of their values. Their values are, are corrupt. And then the other thing he says in this book, which will, he will, it will be echoed again and again and again by the more extremist. He says that the, the West has hated us always from the time of the Crusades. They have never forgotten the Crusades and they still look upon us as someone who should be exterminated. And so he, he constantly refers to the West as Crusaders, the Crusaders. And he uh, then also then the Zionists. So we have Crusaders and Zionists. Those are the evil forces of the West. And if we unpack that, we get some interesting uh, perceptions here because he's not saying Westerners, he's not saying Christians, he's saying Crusaders. So that is when Westerners want to attack us like the Crusaders did or like the Western imperialists, the French and the British did more recently, that is when they're Crusaders. When they're staying in their own country, we have, we have a problem with them. Uh, and similar with Jews, he's not, not saying Jews, he's saying Zionist. And so he's saying when Jews think of themselves as a national group, then we have a problem with that. And so that is, it's, a, it's a kind of an interesting jump because he's, he is aware of the Muslim tradition that says Jews and Christians are to be tolerated. So he's trying, he's trying to argue to his readers that there are cases when these people are, are lose their right to protection. Uh, and that's when they act aggressively toward us. Okay, so that's that book. And that book, you know, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it has a wide dissemination. Uh, people are aware of it. It's very wordy. It's, the, it's, a, it's not clearly thought out in a lot of places. So it's not a... a it's not lucid in many places. Well, it's lucid, but it's not, it's, it's not a, an easy read. So it doesn't have a lot of influence, but he is then the head of the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood and he is imprisoned by Nasser. Uh, in prison, here we're talking about Sayyid Qutb. In, in prison, he writes a commentary on the Quran, which most Muslims think is brilliant. Um, so he, he reads through the Quran very carefully and, and, and discusses, you know, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And um, I know many eminent Muslim scholars who, who don't like his other writings, but who say that his, um, his writings on the Quran, his commentary on the Quran are the equal of some of the commentaries that were written in the, the Middle Ages that, were, that are considered by Muslim scholars as to be the most authoritative commentary. So he's not, a, not an ignorant guy. And in fact, he's, he's very well versed now in Islamic text and language that he uses his time in prison uh, to do this. And then in 1964, he's released from prison by Nasser. And he has a book that's published briefly in Beirut, which is called, in English translation, is Signpost on the Road, which is not a really good translation of the Arabic, because the Arabic word is ma'alim. And it really is, it, he uses the metaphor of caravans and so if you think of, of caravans out in the desert and then they see um, landmarks. And so landmarks actually is a much better word than signpost. So you see a mountain and you know you're going north or whatever. So it is, it's, it's guide, 
well, guidepost, but really is land, I would say more landmarks. But it's a very short book. But what it, it puts forward then, this very radical idea, that um, the, the Muslims today are living in a equivalent society that the people around Muhammad lived. So in, in Mecca, Muhammad was preaching uh, the Quran and he had a few people who, who listened to him and believed him, saw him as a prophet. But the most of the people who lived in Mecca rejected him and, and oppressed them, persecuted the, the Muslims. And so the Muslims, later Muslims, called this period of, of, of Arabia before Muhammad and Arabia in Mecca at the time of Muhammad as the Jahaliya, and that word is on your list. Jahal means ignorant in Arabic. Jahaliya then is a kind of an abstract noun. It could mean ignorance, but in Arabic usually it means, and the usage is that at the time of ignorance. So it's a time when we didn't know God. We didn't know how to live our, a moral, upright life. And uh, so uh, the Muslims then, the followers of Muhammad, they had to flee Mecca and they went to Medina. And the flight, the word for flight in Arabic is hijrah. And that happened in 622. And so that is the beginning for Muslims. That's, that's, for, that's year one, because the Islam for them doesn't start with the birth of Muhammad, doesn't start with the first revelation, but starts with 622 when the Muslims left uh, Mecca and went to the city of Medina, north of this, about 100 miles north of, uh, of Mecca, and they established a political community. So it's the establishment of a Muslim political state. So it's a state where the law is the Islamic law, the law of the prophet, and the, the head of state is the prophet. So it is, a, um, it is a community that is a state as well. And so that's for Muslims, that then is the beginning of their, their history. Um, so what is, what, go back to Sayyid Qutb, he uses that parallel and he says, we are the true believers and we could be just 10 of us. And he says, this is where the word Qaeda comes in. He says, we are the Qaeda. So that's Q-A, again, that um, apostrophe, I-D-A. And in Arabic, that means the base, the support, what something rests upon. And we are the base. We are the foundation then of this new Muslim society. We are the ones who are willing to go and fight uh, to bring that Muslim society uh, into fruition. We have to withdraw ourselves uh, from, and in Egypt, I'll talk about this in a minute, in Egypt, the followers did start to set up settlements out in the desert where they practiced and trained. Sorry about that. Um, that um, the, the trained, and just like the prophet took the people to Medina, we'll go to, we'll go to, uh, hello? Hello. Again, probably, probably the problem of trying to do a lecture in your office. Um, so uh, the, the, he said, the, say, could the Muslims have to do that? And what do we do? We have to fight our society. We have, to, we have to fight these people who say they're Muslims, but really aren't Muslims. So he reintroduces then the idea of tech fear. The idea that we, we will say that these Muslims aren't Muslims and therefore it's our duty to fight them. And so, hello, I'm in a meeting. Um, so, uh, the, uh, that then is the basis of the more radical Islam that we get. Um, the um, Qutb then, Nasser, we arrest him, and in 1966, he's uh, hanged by Nasser. He's one of the very few political prisoners that is killed. So again, he's kind of forgotten. People don't pay much attention to him, but there are groups of the Muslim brothers who break off from the uh, constitutional uh, Muslims, I mean the constitutional uh, uh, Muslim brothers and become more radical. And they then start to call themselves uh, Tekfir wa Hijra. And that's then the Egyptian Tekfir, I'm sorry, Egyptian pronunciation of the words Tekfir, then those who we will call it infidels, Hijra is the Egyptian pronunciation of Hijra, which means to begin to leave, to pull ourselves out. So we will, we will withdraw from society. 
we will name people infidels and then we'll come back in force and remove them. Okay, so I realized in talking about him, I left out one of the people that are on the list and is very important, and that is a guy, uh, an Indian Muslim named Abu Allah Maldudi. Uh, he was part of the Muslim intellectual movement in India uh, under the British, with the British period. And he then is one who belongs when, when Gandhi is starting the India Congress uh, movement he then starts the Muslim League. And so he doesn't start it, he's in the Muslim League. And so they are the people who believe that the, the Muslim community of India should separate from the Hindu community and set up their own state. So this is a very important, again, uh, although it happens in India, it is a very important for this new Islamic, uh, Islamist ideology, because here is a group of people who says that the only thing they have in common is their Muslimness. So the Muslims of India have speak many different languages, uh, but they all should then have their own country based entirely on the fact that they are Muslims. And that would be the reason for Pakistan. Now, why he is important, uh, besides saying that Islam is our main identity, not any ethnic identity, he introduces the idea of Hakimiyat, or in, in Urdu, Hakimiya in Arabic, Hakimiya, I'm sure, sorry, the accent's wrong there, Hakimiya. And this is a new, made up word, it, it, it means, um, sovereignty, it translates to English as sovereignty. And it said, he basically, Maududi says sovereignty, we are all these people are talking about nation states and sovereignty. What is sovereignty? He says sovereignty really belongs only to God. And that um, uh, we, uh, that, so, you know, what is God? Why do we know what, how's the base of the state? And so the base of the state, he says, is the Quran. The Quran is our constitution. And this is the, the slogan is repeated over and over again in chants and groups, Islamist groups that are in, uh, and when they have demonstrations in various countries, that's one of their chants, that Islam is, uh, I'm sorry, the Quran is our constitution. I said Islam. The Quran is our constitution. We have a written constitution. It's the Quran. But again, you know, this is a, it's, it's an ideology that has obviously appeal to religious people, believers. But it, it, practically, how do you put that in place? But that word hakimiya then is used by Said Qutb. So he had read um, Maududi uh, works with, which were written in Urdu. He had read them in um, uh, 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 translation in Arabic. And so Maududi is then incorporated into this more radical Islamic ideology. So what is important about Maududi, again, is the idea that Islam clearly is our, our identity. Uh, we don't need no constitution, we got the Quran. Uh, but uh, ironically, Maududi was one of the writers of the Pakistan national constitution. So obviously, although he was more extreme in his writing, he was willing to say that if the constitution uh, abides fully by Islamic law, then it's a legitimate constitution. Okay, so let's stop there. That's the, the, uh, the ideological underpinnings of this uh, Islamist movement. And so now we have to move into the more uh, nuts and bolts. How does this thing get mobilized? And I'm going to talk on, uh, on the next lecture will be on the military regimes in the Arab world, which really are create political, economic, social conditions where this ideology becomes much more popular and has mass appeal. Um, but I won't leave that for another lecture. What I wanna do for the rest of this lecture is move more from the intellectuals to the action. So I mentioned um, that you have uh, a radical group in Egypt. You also have a radical group in Saudi Arabia. And uh, it's ironic because Saudi Arabia is uh, you know, the country where the king claims to be the protector of Islam because he's a protector of the holy places. But there was a lot of unrest in Saudi Arabia, especially after, remember I talked last time, there was the oil boom after 73, Saudi Arabia becomes incredibly rich. The wealth is kept by the royal family. It's a large royal family, it's maybe 5,000 people, but it's still the royal family. Uh, and uh, it doesn't trickle down that much. So a group of uh, army officers led by a guy named Juhayman el uh actually occupy the Grand Mosque of uh, Mecca 
in during the Hajj, during the month of the pilgrimage uh, in 1979. This is, you know, this is about as haraji a thing as you can possibly do. You go into the mosque, you kill the guards there, and you take it over, and you say that you're going to hold on to it until the king resigns. Uh, so the king of Saudi Arabia, the, his name is Fahed at the time, F-A-H-D. King Fahed is, doesn't know what to do. He, he, you know, he can't kill people in the holy mosque. Uh, and so there's a period of negotiations with the religious authorities uh, that will eventually lead to the religious authorities giving a fatwa, a legal uh, ruling, that says it's okay to go in and, and attack these guys because they're harajis. You can kill them. And so the Saudi army, after about a two-week waiting, dickering about this, they, they go in by force. They take um, uh, al Otaibi and, and some of the ones who weren't killed at the time, and the, they're beheaded. Uh, but by doing that, the compromise that the, the Saudis made with the religious establishment was that the Saudi Arabia would be strictly ruled by Wahhabi rules. And we think of what, uh, Saudi Arabia as always being this way, but actually in the 1970s, there were movie theaters in uh, Saudi Arabia. It wasn't, you know, Sin City, but there was, there was more mixing of men and women um, than we think of, well, than exists today. And so, the, especially in Jeddah, which was a port city on the Red Sea, which always was much more, wasn't Wahhabi, it was uh, Shafi. So it was a much more, uh, that's a different interpretation of Islam. So they were much more liberal and it all closes down. The movie theaters close down, everything closes down. The women, you can, in restaurants now, uh, after the 79, uh, there's a family section and there's a men's section and the men's section is all single men. The family section is all either all women or a man in, his women relatives. That's the only men who can sit there or men who with, with their female relatives. So that strict segregation of men and women that we're so familiar with in Saudi Arabia actually doesn't come into place until 1979 or after, right after 79 with the, this compromise with the religious authorities. And so what the, the, the Saudis then do, they use their oil money to help spread the Wahhabi ideas uh, uh, throughout the Muslim world. Uh, so it's a much stricter interpretation. It isn't quite uh, up to Sayyid Qutb's view, but it's much, much more uh, rig rigid in its outlook toward uh, social freedoms than um, had existed in the Muslim world. And you, you get to see it's, sim it's symbolized by the increasing women putting on the headscarf or even the face veil. Face veil called niqab, N-I-Q-A-B. That had only been seen, well, it had been seen in the 19th century, but by the 20th century, that was only being used in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, everywhere else, uh, you don't see, you did not see face veils. Oh, well, except North Africa. North Africa, they do, they continue to use face veils. So veils basically from the eyes down. Uh, but in, in Egypt or in Syria or Iraq, you did not see those. Um, but, but after, as you start to get Saudi money, uh, promoting Wahhabi ideas, um, students going to Saudi Arabia to study, getting scholarships, uh, mosque being funded by the, by the Saudi state, you, increasingly you start to see women wearing these headscarves. And I'll talk more about that in, when I give the lecture on, on Syria. But in both Egypt and in Syria, that then becomes the de rigueur dress of a woman. She, a modest woman has to keep her hair covered, wear a headscarf and wear um, longer clothes. And again, I'll talk a little more about that in, in next lecture. So you get, you get a, a kind of a growing conservatism in the, what's being taught in the mosque. Um, Sufis, which are much more liberal and tolerant, are increasingly seen as un-Islamic, as are Shia. Remember, the Wahhabis definitely did not believe the Shia were, were true Muslims. Uh, and, but the real catalyst then comes in 1979, which is the, I mentioned in the other lecture, is the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. And with the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, um, there is a mobilization on the part of the Saudis and also the Americans that they will fight the Soviet Union um, through the Islamic groups, uh, Mujahid. Mujahid means someone who fights for, fights the jihad. So they began to call the, the, the anti-Soviet uh, resistance Mujahideen. Uh, that means the plural, well, the plural of Mujahid. Um, and so they are the fight warriors of the holy faith. And so anyone who fought communism was by definition a Mujahid because communists are, are atheists. Uh, so the Pakistan government, the 
Saudi government and the United States government all supplied these guys and they really didn't care much about, I mean, they didn't, I shouldn't care much. They didn't pay attention to their ideology. And their ideology is gradually um, uh, radicalizing. And part of the reason of this is that a, a man shows up, a, a, originally a Palestinian, his name is it's on your list here, is um, uh, Abdallah, Abdallah Azam, I'm sorry, Abdallah Azam, sorry, Azam, A Z Z A M, Abdallah Azam. He um, had been in Saudi Arabia. In fact, he had taught Osama bin Laden, was one of his students. Uh, he had then gone to uh, Pakistan and he then started to organize Arab, or so called the, the Arab Afghans, so that is, Arab volunteers who would go into Afghanistan and fight alongside the Mujahid. They would collect money. This is already the age of television. This isn't quite the age of the internet, but this television. And their telethons on, uh, in various Saudi and Gulf TV stations where people are supposed to pledge money to help the, the fight in, in Afghanistan. And so it's the globalization of the jihad. And, and Azam uses this language. He talks about it being a global jihad. And he talks about where are we, where are we Muslims? fighting. We're fighting now in Afghanistan, but eventually we're going to have to also fight in Andalus, so Spain, uh, Central Asia, uh, the, the Soviet republics in, I mean, sorry, this time still uh, Soviet Union, the Muslim populations of, uh, of uh, Soviet Union, uh, the Muslim population in southern Philippines, um, in Palestine, of course, uh, and he lists all these places. Kashmir is another one of the places. He lists all these places where he says Muslims are uh, under oppression and are being, and that Muslims everywhere have to rise up, if not physically, then financially. And he calls this then, this list on your list, the Fard al Ain. Fard is something that is required, and Al Ain is principle. So Fard al Ain is, is a basic principle that if you cannot fight the jihad physically, you have to fight the jihad financially. You have to help the, the mujahids fight their fight. And this then is the beginning of, of what will lead us to uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, which I'll talk about in a, another lecture. But it is the idea that Muslims must mobilize uh, to defend ourselves against these uh, non-Muslims who have taken our, our lands, are threatening our peoples, and that it is a, a, a global war that we fight, that we have to fight um, against the, these people who have invaded our lands. Now, some of the group will then write even more extremely that we have to carry the holy war to until all the world is Muslim. That's the more extreme view. But even among, I mean, but among the, what we we'll call the militant Islamists, then the, the common idea is this idea of a, a global jihad that we have to unite together to fight the infidels and to free our Muslim brothers and to and sisters and to, uh, you know, in, to implement the rule of the Sharia so that our, our leadership, most of our leadership is corrupt and that it is our duty then to overthrow them uh, so that we can fight the fight. That is a necessity to have Muslim governments that are truly Muslim governments. Otherwise, that the suppression of the Muslims around the world will continue. And that then is the, the ideas that, that give rise, as I said, um, um, Osama bin Laden is one of these Arab Afghans. He's from a, a wealthy family. His family was originally from Yemen, but they had lived in Saudi Arabia and uh, his father had made millions and millions of dollars off construction. Um, and so they were part of this, this new generation of Saudis who had this new incredible oil wealth. Uh, and uh, they're, they're, used. And so they've got education often in the West, but again, as I said, it was always technological or scientific education. Uh, and then the, those were all seen as being tools that could be used against this, this fight to fight this global jihad. Um, I just, let me just look over if, I, if I've covered everything. I think that pretty much I've covered all the questions. The questions will be, well, you look at the questions and see if I've covered it, if something is not left out. But then, so what I want you to take away from this, and as I said, this is probably, in terms of understanding the current Middle East, this is probably one of the most important lectures you're going to listen to. 
uh, because it lays out the kind of ideological development of this kind of radical Islamic view of uh, global jihad, which is what we're facing today uh, with ISIS and other such groups, uh, Boko Haram and um, the um, groups in Somalia, um, that the that the, the Islam is under siege, uh, and that the Muslims have to to get together and to defend themselves against this onslaught from the West, and that our enemies are not only the West, but they're also our leaders who have deceived us and who have not protected Muslims, who are not good Muslims themselves, and therefore we say takfir. We 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 condemn them as kafirs, and we then have to fight them as well as fighting um, uh, the, the infidels. So uh, Anwar Sadat in, in 1981 is assassinated by people from a group calling itself Tekfir Wahigra, the group I mentioned earlier that had gone out into the Egyptian desert. So that's the, they burst on the scene then in, in Egypt with the killing of Sadat. Uh, and they are um, chased by the government, but they, they're still there the, the, through Mubarak's time. And they, they increasingly, again, this shows their the kind of the hard line. They, their targets increasingly are Christians. Uh, they shoot Christians, they bomb Christian churches, and they clearly are taking a much harder line against Christians than a, uh, a mainstream Muslim group would do, which is tolerance. So it is this kind of radicalization of Islam that is in reaction the West, actually. I mean, I don't know if I want to blame it. You know, we have Osama Mahdasi saying that the whole, the whole trend in uh, what had been more liberal uh, Arabic, uh, inclusive Arabic, uh, he points out all the constitutions that were written in the, the 30s, 20s, and the 30s, it's all guaranteed religious uh, freedoms uh, and uh, rights for women. And so he says that, that, that move toward liberalization in Arab politics in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and even in the 50s is, is brought to a halt by this, this kind of reaction, this Islamic uh, reaction to, and he, he lays the blame primarily on, on Israel. I wouldn't go that far. I would say that it's a combination of things. And I would say that the blame is, is, is equally, if not more, on the military regimes in the Arab countries. And I'll talk more about those on the next lecture. So I hope I've covered everything. Um, I know there's a lot here, so you might wanna watch this once or twice, but just keep the idea of haraji, the idea that there are these, there was almost from the beginning of Islam, the idea that there were radicals who go outside the boundaries of Islam. Uh, and who shock the Muslim world by their willingness to take lives because it says quite frankly in the Quran, if we take the Quran as our constitution, it says Muslims shall not kill Muslims. Uh, and so the, the whole idea that you can say that you can kill Muslims, and then you have to justify it. And they justify it by using this, invoking this idea of Muslims who cease to be true Muslims, we can kill them. But of course it gives us the the ability to say who is the true Muslim. And that itself is something that most Muslims at the time, as we saw when, when the Wahhabis attacked Iraq or Mecca, most Sunni Muslims thought that was unacceptable. And most Sunni Muslims actually felt that the attack on the Twin Towers uh, in the United States was unacceptable. So, uh, um, but it is, it is a strain there. Uh, I mean, it is a trend, it is a, a subculture of the, Islam that is there. And it draws on its traditions to justify itself, to say, well, this is why it's legitimate. Um, so I think, I hope you get something out of this. And because like I said, I think it's going to be with us for, I know for the rest of my lifetime, but I think it, it will be until this, the political social conditions in the Muslim world uh, improve, I, I think it will always be uh, an alternative to people, young people especially, who are feeling desperate, and that's why next lecture is so important. Uh, the rise of a, of, a, of a population which feels that it has no say in its, its, its government, has no say in its, its future, and it sees this appeal to this past, this glorified past, this past where everything was perfect, uh, as very appealing to them. It's, 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 it gives them a great deal of hope. 
Um, at the same time, for us, it just seems incredibly violent. Uh, but there, uh, those who espouse it would say, well, the violence is necessary in order to get the paradise. And that it should remind you of the extreme communists or Nazis or any of the other kind of ideologies that have emerged in the West. The idea that we know best for the rest of you. And if we have to use extreme measures to get to what is best for all of you, then so be it. So that's kind of a pessimistic note. So I'll leave on a more happier note. I hope everything is going well with you here in Connecticut. Is it, uh, it is starting to look like spring. I noticed walking into campus today that the lilacs are, are budding and the uh, robins are here. And so although we're in complete lockdown, uh, we, are, we are allowed to go out and walk. And so I recommend if you are allowed to go out and walk where, walk where you are, that you do so as well and be well until I talk to you again. Uh, goodbye. I mean, I can turn ourselves off. I will.